Chapter Three, Part Two of the Complete Book of Cheese. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Complete Book of Cheese by Robert Carlton Brown. Chapter Three, Part Two, Foreign Greats Continued. Feta and Casere. The Greeks have a name for it. Feta. Their neighbors call it Greek cheese. Feta is to cheese what hymettus is to honey. The two together make ambrosial manner. Feta is soft and as blinding white as a plate of fresh ricotta smothered with sour cream. The whiteness is preserved by shipping the cheese all the way from Greece in kegs sloshing full of milk, the milk being renewed from time to time. Having been cured in brine, this great sheep milk curd is slightly salty and somewhat sharp, but superbly spicy. When first we tasted it fresh from the keg with salty milk dripping through our fingers, we gave it full marks. This was at the Stikos Brothers Greek Import Store on West 23rd Street in Manhattan. We then compared Feta with thin wisps of its grown-up brother, Casere, this grey and greasy, hard and brittle palate tickler of sheep's milk, made us bleat for more Feta. Gorgonzola. Gorgonzola, least pretentious of the Blues triumvirate, including Grotfort and Stilton, is nonetheless by common consent monarch of all other blues from argentina to denmark in england indeed many epicures consider gorgonzola greater than stilton which is the highest praise any cheese can get there like all great cheeses it has been widely imitated but never equalled imported gorgonzola when fruity ripe is still firm but creamy and golden inside with rich green veins running through very pungent and highly flavoured it is eaten sliced or crumbled to flavour salad dressings, like Roquefort. Ablé crème chantilly. The name Ablé crème chantilly sounds French, but the cheese is Swedish and actually lives up to the blurb in the imported package. The overall characteristic is indescribable and delightful freshness. This exclusive product of the Waltgaard Creamery was hailed by Sheila Hibbard in the New Yorker of May the sixth, nineteen fifty as enthusiastic as Brie la Savara would have greeted a new dish, or the planetarium a new star. Endeavouring to be as restrained as I can, I shall merely suggest that the arrival of Crème Chantilly is a historic event, and that in reporting on it, I feel something of the responsibility that the contemporaries of Madame Arel, the famous cheese-making lady of Normandy, must have felt when they were passing judgment on the first Camembert. Miss Hibben goes on to say that only a fromage à la crème made in quebec had come anywhere near her impression of the new swedish triumph she quotes the last word from the makers themselves this is a very special product that has never been made on this earth before and speaks of the elusive flavour of mushrooms before summing up the exquisitely textured curd and the unexpectedly fresh flavour combined to make it one of the most subtly enjoyed foods that have come my way in a long time and so say we all of us hand cheese hand cheese has this niche in our cheese hall of fame not because we consider it great but because it is usually included among the eighteen varieties on which the hundreds of others are based it is named from having been moulded into its final shape by hand universally popular with germanic races it is too strong for the others to our mind hand cheese never had anything that Allgäuer or limburger hasn't improved upon it is the only cheese that is commonly melted into steins of beer and drunk instead of eaten it is usually studded with caraway seeds, the most natural spice for curds. Limburger Limburger has always been popular in America, ever since it was brought over by German-American immigrants, but England never took to it. This is eloquently expressed in the following entry in the English Encyclopedia of Practical Cookery. Limburger cheese is chiefly famous for its pungently offensive odour. It is made from skimmed milk, and allowed to partially decompose before pressing. It is very little known in this country, and might be less so with advantage to consumers. But this is libel. Butter soft and sapid, Limburger has brought gustatory pleasure to millions of hardy gastronomes since it came to light in the province of Lüttich in Belgium. It has been Americanized for almost a century, and is by now one of the very few cheeses successfully imitated here, chiefly in New York and Wisconsin. Early Wisconsiners will never forget the Limburger Rebellion in Greene County when the people rose in protest against the Limburger caravan that was accustomed to park in the little town of Monroe where it was marketed. They threatened to stage a modern Boston tea party and dump the odiferous bricks in the river 
when five or six wagon-loads were left ripening in the sun in front of the town bank. The Limburger was finally stored safely underground. Livarot. Livarot has been described as decadent, the very Verlaine of them all, and Victor Mersey personifies it in a poem dedicated to all the great French cheeses, of which we give a free translation. In the dog days in its overflowing dish, Livarot gesticulates or weeps like a child. Münster. At the diplomatic banquet, one must choose his piece. All is politics, a cheese and a flag. You annoy the Russians if you take Chester. You irritate the Prussians in choosing Münster. Victor Mersey. Like Limburger, this male cheese, often caraway-flavoured, does not fare well in England. Although over here we consider Münster far milder than Limburger, the English writer Eric Weir in When Madame Cooks will have none of it. I cannot think why this cheese was not thrown from the aeroplanes during the war to spread panic amongst enemy troops. It would have proved far more efficacious than those nasty deadly gases that kill people permanently. Neuchâtel If the cream cheese be white, far fairer the hands that made them. Arthur Hugh Clough Although originally from Normandy, Neuchâtel, like Limburger, was so long ago welcome to America, and made so splendidly at home here, that we may consider it our very own. All we have against it is that it is served as the model for too many processed abominations. Parmesan, Romana, Pecorino, Pecorino Romana. Parmesan, when young, soft, and slightly crumbly, is eaten on bread. But when well aged, let us say up to a century, it becomes rock of Gibraltar of cheeses and really suited for grating. It is easy to believe that the so-called Spanish cheese used as a barricade by Americans in Nicaragua almost a century ago, was none other than the almost indestructible grana, as Parmesan is called in Italy. The association between cheese and battling began in B.C. days with the Jews and Romans, who fed cheese to their soldiers not only for its energy value, but as a convenient form of rations, since every army travels on its stomach and can't go faster than its impedimenta. The last notable mention of cheese in war was the name of the monitor, a cheese box on a raft. Romano is not as expensive as Parmesan, although it is as friable, sharp and tangy for flavouring, especially for soups such as onion and minestrone. It is brittle and just off-white when well aged. Although made of sheep's milk, Pecorino is classed with both Parmesan and Romano. All three are excellently imitated in Argentina. Romano and Pecorino Romano are interchangeable names for the strong, medium-sharp and piquant Parmesan types that sell for considerably less. Most of it is now shipped from Sardinia. There are several different kinds. Pecorino Dolce, sweet, Sardo Tuscano, and Pecorino Romano Caccio, which relates it to Caccio Cavallo. Kibitz has complained that some of the cheaper types of Pecorino are soapy, but fans give it high praise. Gillian F., in her letter from Italy, in Osbert Burdett's delectable little book of cheese, writes, Out in the orchard, my companion, I don't remember how, had provided the miracle. A flask of wine, a loaf of bread, and a slab of fresh pecorino cheese. There wasn't any thou for either, but that cheese was paradise, and the flask was emptied, and a wood dove cooing made you think that the flask's contest were in a crystal goblet instead of an enamel cup, one only, and the cheese broken with the fingers, a cheese of cheeses. Pont d'Avec This semi-soft, medium-strong, golden-tinted French classic made since the 13th century is definitely a dessert cheese, whose excellence is brought out best by a sound claret or tawny port. Port Salut, see Trappist. Provolone. Within recent years, Provolone has taken America by storm, as Camembert, Roquefort, Swiss, Limburger, Neuchâtel, and such great ones did long before. But it has not been successfully imitated here, because the original is made of rich water buffalo milk unattainable in the Americas. With Caccio Cavallo, this mellow, smoky, flavoursome delight is put up in all sorts of artistic forms, red cellophane apples, pears, bells, a regular zoo of animals, and in all sorts of sizes, up to a monumental hundred-pound bas-relief, imported for exhibition purposes by Phil Alpert. The Roquefort. Homage to this fromage. Long hailed as Le Roi, the Roquefort, it has filled books and booklets beyond count. By the miracle of Penicillium Roqueforti, a new cheese was made. It is placed historically back around the 8th century when Charlemagne was found picking out the green spots of Persile with the point of his knife, thinking them decay. But the monks of Saint-Gal, who were his hosts, 
recorded in their annals that when they regaled him with a hot for because it was friday and they had no fish they also made bold to tell him he was wasting the best part of the cheese so he tasted again found the advice excellent and liked it so well he ordered two cases of it sent every year to his palace at aix-la-chapelle he also suggested that it be cut in half first to make sure it was well veined with blue and then bound up with a wooden fastening perhaps he hoped the wood would protect the cheeses from mice and rats for the good monks of st gall couldn't be expected to send an escort of cats from their chalky caves to guard them even for charlemagne there is no telling how many cats were mustered out in the caves in those early days but a recent census put the number at five hundred we can readily imagine the head handler in the caves leading a night inspection with a candle followed by his chief taster and a regiment of cats while the dutch and other makers of cheese also employ cats to patrol their storage caves the roquefort holds the record for number an interesting point in this connection is that as rats and mice pick only the prime cheeses a gnawed one is not thrown away but greatly prized sapsago sharptiger or swiss green cheese the name sapsago is a corruption of sharptiger german for whey cheese it's a hay cheese flavoured heavily with melilot a kind of clover that's also grown for hay it comes from switzerland in a hard truncated cone wrapped in a piece of paper that says to be used grated only genuine swiss green cheese made of skim milk and herbs to the housewives do you want a change in your meals try the contents of this wrapper delicious as spreading mixed with butter excellent for flavouring eggs macaroni spaghetti potato soup etc can be used in place of any other cheese do not take too much you might spoil the flavour we put this wrapper among our papers sealed it tight in an envelope and to this day six months later the scent of subsago clings round it still stilton honour for cheeses literary and munching circles in london are putting quite a lot of thought into a proposed memorial to stilton cheese there is a stilton memorial committee with sir john squire at the head and already the boys are fighting one side led by sir john is all for a monument this presumably would not be a replica of stilton itself although mr epstein could probably hack out a pretty effective cheese-shaped figure and call it dolorosa the monument boosters plan a figure of mrs paulet who first introduced stilton to england possibly a group showing mrs paulet holding a young stilton by the hand and introducing it while the stilton curtsies t s eliot does not think that any one would look at a monument but wants to establish a foundation for the preservation of ancient cheeses the practicability of this plan could depend largely on the site selected for the treasure house and the cost of obtaining a curator who could or would give his whole time to the work mr j a simons who is secretary of the committee agrees with mr elliot that a simple statue is not the best form i should like he says something irrelevant gargoyles perhaps i think that mr simons has hit on something there i would suggest if we americans can pitch into this great movement some gargoyles designed by mr rube goldberg if the memorial could be devised so as to take on an international scope an exchange fellowship might be established between england and america although the exchange in the case of stilton would have to be all on england's side we might be allowed to furnish the money however while england furnishes the cheese there is a very good precedent for such a bargain between the two countries robert benchley in after 1903 what when all seems lost in england there is still stilton an endless after-dinner conversation piece to which england points with pride for a sound appreciation of this cheese see clifton fadiman's introduction to this book taleggio and bel paese when the great italian cheesemaker galbini first exported bel paese some years ago it was an eloquent ambassador to america but as the years went on and imitations were made in many lands galbini did it wise to set up his own factory in our beautiful country however the domestic bel paese and a minute one powder called bel paesino just didn't have that old alpine zest they were no better than the german copy called schoenland after the original or the french fleur des alpes melfino was a blend of bel paese and gorgonzola it perked up the market for a full fruity cheese with snap then galbini hit the jackpot with his taleggio that fills the need for the sharpest most sophisticated pungence of them all trappist port salut or port du salut and ochre in spite of its name trappist is no rat trap commoner 
always of the elect and better known as port salut or port du salut from the original home of the trappist monks in their chief french abbey it is also set apart from the ordinary canadians under the name of oka from the trappist monastery there it is made by trappist monks all over the world according to the original secret formula and by trappist cistercian monks of the abbey of gethsemani trappist in kentucky this is a soft cheese creamy and of superb flavour you can't go wrong if you look for the monastery names stamped on such as arce in belgium mont in flanders saint anne doré in brittany and so forth last but not least a commercial port salut entirely without benefit of clergy or monastery is made in milwaukee under the lion brand it is one of the finest american cheeses in which we have ever sunk a fan End of chapter three part two